I'm back in the workshop fixing some issues that occurred as a result of my last outing. Dense snowdrifts packed under the engine bay, pushing my diesel heater ducting into the harmonic balancer, which unfortunately burnt a hole in the ducting. I also broke a front U-joint on the front chromoly shaft, which stranded me in some tough snow conditions. And also one of the worst storms in the last 25 years hit that evening, which did reassure me that my DIY load bars are not going anywhere. So at least there's that. But my first project is to build a skid plate that can protect the diesel heater from the deep snow. I've got some five millimeter plate, which I've cut and bent to shape so it can sit underneath the fan cowl. Initially though, I'm gonna make two mounting points on the front cross member so it can be bolted in position while I work out how I'm gonna finalize it. Now that this thing can sit in place, I can confirm my bends are correct by welding the cuts I've made for the bend lines. I'm gloveless like an idiot because I've misplaced my gauntlets, so please forgive my stupidity. But my plan with this skid is to weld in an exhaust flange so that the exhaust pipe forces the diesel heater into the front cross member under tension. It should work, in theory, but I'm thumbing my way through this build like usual, so I'll have to see how it goes. With the skid installed, I can see already that two support arms will be required for frame support. These will bolt into the old M10 sway bar holes, mostly to stop the skid bending up into the fan cowl under pressure. That is probably one of the most hideous things I've ever created on this channel but it'll work. That's the main thing, right? Um, basically, it's like a skid plate, as well as supporting the, the diesel heater. It's actually gonna hold the diesel heater in place as well with the exhaust, but you've got these two spuddy Delaney arms left and right that are gonna tie into the frame. So in all fairness, it might actually act as a brace across the steering box to the other side of the frame, although the frame's like 13 millimeters thick at the front there and sandwiched both sides, so I really don't think the steering box has got any issues, but I kind of had to put these two arms there because if you remember in the last video, the snow really has quite a lot of force behind it. When you charge into the snow, like a full-on Megalodon dildo, it gets right underneath the vehicle and, and it sort of forces itself up into the engine bay to the point where I could hear the fan clipping the cowl, so there was a lot of force going up. So without these arms, I noticed I could just push the metal plate up and basically push the cowl, um, but it's not my proudest creation. of shit. Go in. Please go in. I hate you. <coughs> this is fun. I'm having fun. I'm having so much fun. Please go in. I mean, you know. There. Have you gone in cross-threaded and shit? Probably. Nature's lock type. The skid plate is in place, but I'll be honest with you, I don't like it. Not because it was a joy to install, but more just because of how everything works together. 
or isn't working together. The orientation of the heater just isn't good at all. And to remove the heater and perform the simple task of changing a glow plug, which is a common maintenance task, it means dropping the sway bar, then the skid plate, and then disconnecting everything from the diesel heater to hang it down from its coolant lines. It just seems messy and layered. So I'm draining the coolant from the engine and I'm changing the orientation of the heater to work with the skid as one unit. So that concludes it. The OCD has almost been satisfied. I really couldn't leave it just how it was. Just because from a maintenance perspective, it was just too difficult. Like if I wanted to get to the diesel heater just to change a glow plug, I'd have to take the skid plate off, unthread all the hosing. The orientation of the heater wasn't really how I wanted it to be. Because the thing about these diesel heaters is the, the fuel line has to be at the top if they're on their side. So that's why you saw it orientated the other way before, because that was the only way the exhaust would face the back. Now, I didn't want the intake and the exhaust facing down. There isn't enough space, obviously, to elevate it under here and have the pipe scooting out from under the plate or from above the plate. And, and having it facing down means snow gets packed up into these and you're just gonna get problems. So I think this is the best orientation. So it's at an angle slightly to avoid the steering box and that's it really. So I'm gonna connect all that up and it just means that you can loosen those two bolts, uh, two nuts, and the whole unit will pop off and then you can change your glow plug. So it's just all one thing really. This is a lot of fun to put in. A lot easier than the last time. This is actually working a lot better than I thought it would, which is kind of nice actually, because it's been a pain in the absolute ass trying to get this thing sorted. Oh. Everything is mounted in better than expected, and my next task is to build a scaled down version of an elephant dick. This will serve two functions, scaring off Bigfoot and as an insulated duct to the roof tent which will contain the heat in this longer setup. A small rubber toilet seat has arrived also, which looks nothing like its online product imagery or description, but for now it should stop snow getting into the cowl duct. So the OCD has been partially satisfied. There's still a few things, but I should be able to should be able to sleep tonight. I just uh, you know, it's like a, yeah, just a couple of cables and you know, bag up. Don't forget to bag up. Right. So I'll give you a little first hand tour. Obviously, this stuff's all the same. So the ducts of the roof tent with the valve for the car, all the roof tent at the moment is set to the roof tent. I've installed the toilet just here. And this duct sort of goes in there, basically. And um, I've insulated it because it's going to be outside the vehicle. And as you can probably see, the temperature's here pretty cold. It's about minus 30 this morning. It's warmed up a bit. Um, but the intake for the diesel heater now is this side. So obviously it needs a filter or something on there. But that, that's where it's taking clean air from, which kind of makes sense. It's the, the sort of intake side of the vehicle. And underneath you've got the skid plate so um, it connects up to I think that's where the old sway bar used to go but obviously I relocated mine when I put this um this hub on uh, you've got a little bit of stuff at the front the annoying thing is that the exhausts now at the front and that's kind of the issue with diesel heaters they have to be orientated so that the the fuel intake is at the top of the diesel heater so this can't be flipped the other way for the exhaust to be at the back. Otherwise, it'll have to be the way it was before, where the outlet is the other side and the intake's this side. Um, but um, you've got a way shorter pipe now, so that just goes straight up to the Y. A nice bend, you know, all the fuel lines and stuff. This is a bit vulnerable. In hindsight, a removable triangular piece is going to be added there. Um, removable, so... If there's a problem with any of this, I can access it without dropping the whole thing. So it's going to sort of bolt in. I'll weld some studs on. I mean, the exhaust I haven't really figured out yet. I'm going to put that there somewhere. But it's pretty clean. You know, you've got the intake there. 
everything's pretty much out the way of the Pitman armor where it's supposed to be anyway. So that can move freely. And as I said, it's like totally compartmentalized off from the um, the engine. So there's no way of actually getting to the engine because there's a lip at the top that sort of stops anything getting back there. So yeah, it's pretty cool. With the heater reading zero on the carbon monoxide detector, I'm moving on to the broken U-joint on the chromoly shaft. The eyes of the stub shaft got badly damaged, so I've straightened them as best as I possibly can, using two standard stub shafts as templates. We get some top quality parts here in Europe. Check it out, Japan parts. <sighs> Broke one already, just arrived. Tried to fit it and press it in and the bottom of the U-joint cap cracked off. So that's awesome, but um, these are always supposed to be temporary. I wanted to make up two spare shafts using these kind of cheaper U-joint parts. And then what I was going to do with my chromolies was put in those 5-760X U-joints that you get from Spicer. Um, I've actually ordered two of those, but they won't be here for another week. And I'm in a bit of a predicament, and I'll kind of show you what I've got here. It's a pretty typical brake. Uh, this is the chromoly here, and, and this is how it was mounted. So this part was still in there, and it broke off and span round and kind of beat the hell out of these eyes on the stub shaft. So. I've had to repair this stub shaft as best I can. It was bent, so I've straightened it and I've just kind of measured it all, checked it with the other stub shafts I've got, and I think I've pretty much got it in spec. But the issue I've got now is the U joint caps are actually kind of loose in the eyes. You know, they can spin in the eyes, and you can kind of push some of them all the way through. So uh, when I fit a U joint on this now, it's going to have to be welded um, with two little half moons here and here. It's not really a big deal, I've done it in the past, it does keep them in place, but obviously it's not ideal, even though this is full clipped. But I've got these other two shafts here, these are the spares. Um, well, these are the ones that came out of the Jeep before I got chrome mollies, and my idea was to use these cheaper U-joints to build two spares up, um, and have those in the vehicle, and then when the 5-760 dog dump, whatever they're called, U-joints come, I fit them to this. I weld, I get it all done, and I've got two decent chromoly shafts in the vehicle and a couple of spares that aren't so good but they might get me out of a pinch. I've decided to build up a standard shaft with the Japan Parts U-joint for the time being, and I've set aside my chromoly until the stronger U-joints arrive from the US, mainly because if I have to weld the caps on the chromoly, I don't want to do it twice, and it's better that it's more permanent with a stronger U-joint the first time round. But the problem I'm having is this Japan Parts U-joint is passing straight through the eyes on this new Spicer stub shaft. So I'm going to have to weld this one as well, which I honestly would rather not do, because it means grinding the welds away when changing U-joints. Easy to do in the workshop, not possible at all when you're out in the wilderness without a grinder. Pretty horrible, but uh, I'm not really left with much choice, to be honest with you. Sorry, Jeep. Probably gonna break. There we go. I'm gonna have to open the diff. Something doesn't feel right. I think the spider gears are toast. Let's see what the fluid's like. Oh. There's lots of pieces of metal in there. Fuck, that's so bad. That's not a piece of the spider gear. It's the uh, the ring gear. Oh no, that's so sad, isn't it? Look at that. Toast. But a lot of you will say it there, you shouldn't be surprised given it's a Dana 30. I'm just going to rotate that so you can find the brake. Oh, there she is. Crack, that is mank, look at it. 
Before I get into this horror, I'm reassembling the front end with just stub shafts, so at least the Jeep's drivable in two-wheel drive for the time being. Well, what a joyous afternoon it's been. Since discovering the differential was totally ruined, I went outside and painstakingly took apart the four litre. Um, I say painstakingly because I really didn't want to touch that Jeep. It's a nice Jeep and if you look underneath it, there's so little corrosion on really the, the essential areas of it. It's, it's just a shame to, to even consider using it as a donor vehicle. The plan is for that vehicle, and it still is, to, to restore it. And there's not really that much that needs to be done, a little bit of corrosion work, a little bit of paint, um, get the interior nice and then put it through the inspection and basically it's on the road. But I've got two differentials on the table obviously because I took that one out of the four litre and actually I have an abundance of axle shafts now because um, I've got the shafts out of the four litre too and they're, they're in pretty good condition, uh, probably the originals from that vehicle. But the issue is the differentials and I'm really not sure what to do. Um, so this is a 373 carrier and this is a 355 crack carrier. So there's a carrier break there, meaning that um, the carriers are actually different. Now, I don't think that applies to spider gears, but what I'm gonna do is take these spider gears out of this carrier and put it in my carrier. And you know, I'm, I'm kind of surprised at how my differential on my vehicle failed. I know a lot of you are gonna shoot me down and go, look, Mike, we told you the Dana 30 has no place in the off-road world, you know, you were pushing it with the 35s and the chains. I'm, I probably was, um, but I actually think that my differential was on its way out. It was making a bit of a noise, and if you watch this video, which somebody commented on and pointed out, I never saw it before, but when I'm turning the nut on the end of the axle, you can see the spider gears moving quite a lot. There's quite a lot of deflection. And if you're looking at these spider gears on mine, you know, that they've kind of been in the vehicle for the last 26 or something years that the vehicle's been used. I've obviously been using it with bigger tires and everything else and more weight, and perhaps it was just prematurely worn. And possibly that's why it failed so catastrophically because I'm kind of surprised that the internals went, you know, I'm not surprised a U-joint popped, you know, an auto dock U-joint, you know, that it did well to last a year and a half, well, a couple of years it's been in there. But the internals of the diff, I wouldn't have thought that would have died. And, and I'm kind of gutted that I chipped a tooth now. That probably chipped due to the sh shrapnel rattling round inside the differential rather than the stress on the gears. That is a gutter because I literally just re-geared it not long ago to 488. So those are kind of new gears and they've actually worn in okay too. And that brings me to my next point, which is what am I going to do going forward? Now, I think it's kind of fruitless. Um, me spending money on a new ring and pinion and, and going through the motions of, of rebuilding up that Dana 30 because I kind of really took the Dana 30 to a point where I really toughened it up as, as much as I kind of thought it needed to be toughened up to. You know, it had chromolies. Sure, I could have gone with a higher spline count. You know, it's trussed, it's sleeved, it's gusseted and all that kind of stuff. You know, it's just kind of as tough as it needs to be for my vehicle. And, and obviously what's failed now is internal. And once internals start failing, you know, you're really at a point where it, it's probably the wrong hard hardware for the application, if you know what I mean, because to beef up the internals, you've either got to buy different metal types or something like that or, or whatever, and it's probably going to get very expensive. And at the end of the day, you're still kind of like having that same small ring and pinion and everything else with that with that axle. Now, I know a lot of you have warned me about the Dana 30, and, I, and I'm well aware of it, but, you know, I, I live in Europe, and it's very difficult to find parts. You know, a Dana 44 is like as rare as rocking horse shit, as I told you. So, you know, for me to sort of buy a new ring and pinion and, and throw a load of money back at the Dana 30 and, and restore it to its former glory sort of feels not like the right thing to do because I've just done all that, and it's failed. Um, I could do all that, and it could fail again, and then it would have been... An, again, a big waste of time. So I think what I'm gonna do is grind down the edges on that chip so it's smooth, not like totally smooth, but just take away the cutting edges and leave that ring ring gear on, put the spider gears from this carrier in this carrier, if they fit, hopefully they do. Um, get the shafts restored. Obviously when those new U joints come, those 5-760X joints, I'll 
basically um, get those chromolys back together and put those back in. Um, and uh, yeah, and just kind of run it. Dear Metal, please be stronger next time. P.S. Yours truly, Mike. Dear Diffoil, please stop stinking and piss. Dear Drill Bit, Thanks for being everything apart from a drill. Let's rotate these whores out. They won't even come out because they're so fucked. <laughs> you won't even come out anymore because you're a bastard. How am I going to get these out, you shitters? Oh, pieces of metal. There we go. Another. And there he is. It's all looking pretty grim. Do you know, I think it's going to take a little more than me just swapping these things out. Obviously, I'm, I need to clean everything and uh, make sure it's all running good because it's, you know, I don't think you can. I don't think you can just take one from the other and just expect expect it all to be all right. If I'm honest with you, I mean it doesn't seem logical to me. I mean maybe there's people out there who are like actually it's fine, but actually managed to get that. I mean, do I need to use a different pin? I don't know. All feels a bit weird. I think what I'll do is I'll go and Google all of this. One thing I have noticed about these axle shafts, though, that came out that 1990, much smaller U-joint. Well, what a week it's been. I'm, uh, you know, in the spare time I've had with all the work I've been doing, the diesel heater, for one, was a massive amount of work. The amount of times I put that in and out, the diesel heater, it was just, it was killing me at one point. And now discovering that diff, if I'd known the diff would have been the way it was, I would have done that first. But in all fairness, it would have disheartened me so much, I wouldn't have got that diesel heater build done. So at least that, that build is pretty good. I mean, the axle's back the way it was before. So though you saw me put it together on the bench there, I took it back off, I cleaned it thoroughly, I checked all the clearances and tolerances with the spider gears. Everything looked good, it's back in. In all fairness, that shaft, that side, is that Fisher Price drive shaft, which is going to break with that Japan parts um, U-joint. I mean, I don't know how that's gonna behave. That was atrociously put together. I mean, I had to weld it in, it was so loose. You know, it was just, it was terrible. So that is a get me home shaft. I'll take it out when the 5760X joints come, put those joints in the chrome mollies I got on the bench and get those back in. And, uh, and I'll carry those, the, the kind of crappy shafts just to, just to get me home. And I think that's a kind of a logical solution really going forward. But I am a bit gutted really that the diff kind of detonated, but I'm actually not surprised. I do suspect my spider gears are on their way out. It was very noisy, the front diff. I mean, I expect a U-joint to go, but for, for, the, for the spider gears to blow up like that, there has to be something more going on. Going forward, you might say, why didn't you put a lunchbox locker in? What a great opportunity. But if you're saying that, you might not live in a climate like me. Um, you know, when you look at the roads out here, you don't want to be driving those roads with a lunchbox locker. And it's not just me saying that, you know, all the guys I speak to up here, um, we do off-roading and overlanding in Northern Europe say the same thing. And those who do have them say, you've got to drive them really carefully um, because you need control over the axle, really, when, when you're going at speeds around bends. You know, if, if, if you're kind of in four wheel drive and you've got your foot down and that lunchbox lock is engaged and those wheels are spinning at the same rate, you go around a corner, there's a strong possibility you're gonna keep going that way and end up in the ditch. And, and I've seen videos of people sort of demonstrating that and, and it's kind of sketchy. So really going forward, an e-locker is what I want, not an air locker, because again, in this climate, they're not good because of the, the tight airlines tend to freeze. 
so an e-locker would be would be what I'd want and, and that's another 10,000 crowns you know in that axle so I really need to think about it I've got this back to the way it was you know and I can use it how I've been using it on my previous trips except I'll pick my battles a bit differently and I might avoid putting chains on the front there or I might not there was one trip I did and I'll show you clips of it I was absolutely hammering up that track um, not in this particular video but when I went back with a friend of mine I took him and his son camping and we went up to that spot and I was nailing it up there with with those chrome mollies those auto dock u-joints you saw die in the last video and in this video and, and that was the last year and perhaps it, i just think there was more to it than, than just a failed u-joint but anyway i've talked enough hopefully i've justified my bullshit to myself because that's really what this is all about i'm just justifying it to me i'm a sinking ship and i just i've had enough of this so thanks for watching I'll see you very soon in another video. Take care.